Good evening, I'm Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and welcome to the Oculus webinar educational series. Tonight, I'm really pleased to have with me a good friend of mine, Dr. Tom Wyshevsky. The title of our presentation is How the Oculus Pentacam Can Enhance Your Corneal GP Lenses. Tom is a 1987 graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Dr. Wyshevsky has specialized in contact lenses for over three decades. He earned his fellowship from the International Academy of Orthokeratology in 2009 and served on the board of directors for the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control from 2009 to 2019. He's a former host of the Academy's OrthoK podcast series and has served as co-host of the annual Vision by Design Bootcamp for Beginners and has lectured extensively on orthokeratology and myopia control to doctors around the world. He's been featured in several television news stories about orthokeratology, myopia control, and children's vision. Originally from New Jersey, but now practicing in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for the past 15 years, where he's built a successful orthok, myopia control practice, and specialty contact lens practice. Dr. Wyshewski has recently added a thriving dry program to his practice, but with no further ado, Dr. Tom Wyshewski, take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction, Bill. Um, so the title is How to Oculus Pentacam Can Enhance Your Corneal GP Lenses, or How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Corneal GP Lenses. And, you know, at first blush, the thought of corneal GP lenses, I mean, come on, Tom, they've been around forever, uh, for more than 70 years, and what's new? Well, turns out that there's quite a bit new, and I'm not going to be talking about your grandpa's GP lens. We're gonna be talking about some really new stuff. Some of it just came out uh, last month and different concepts in designing corneal GP lenses. I'm gonna talk about the how to do that, but first I wanna take a few minutes and just give you some background information. I wanna talk a little bit about the GP lens market, traditional corneal GP lenses, and why topographic and really tomographic designs are such a game changer. And finally, that's when I'll get into that, that really new stuff, and I'll do some case reports. So let's get started. If we look at the contact lens market, we know that it's grown over the past few years, and it's, it's expected to continue to grow for several years to come. But if we look, if we hone in on the gas perm market, you can see these blue box, boxes down at the bottom. They are, um, they're showing us that there's not a lot of growth in GP lenses. Now we know that's not true because we know, we understand the GP lens market has changed, but let's take a look at it. So we'll look at the segments in the GP lens market. Corneal GP lenses account for 70% of the entire GP lens market. Sclerols account for 14%, ortho K for 10%, and hybrids the remaining 6%. Now, if the corneal GP market, if the GP market in general is, is flat, it really doesn't seem to be growing. That's not true of all the segments. So if we look at the ortho K market, we know that that's growing. You know, when I first did my first ortho K fit back in 1986, uh, no one was doing it. And for years, there was really no growth in ortho K or very little. Uh, but more recently, since myopia management has become a thing, uh, there's a lot more interest. So the market for ortho K lenses is growing. But perhaps the biggest area of growth in GP in the GP lens market is in sclerals. All right, we all know that you can barely open a, a journal without seeing an article about sclerals or or ortho K. But as great as scleral lenses are, and we're all fitting a lot of them these days, there's no question about it. They do some amazing things. We can change a lot of patients' lives with them. But are they always the best solution for every single patient? That's a great question. And I, you know, I've got to tell you, in my opinion, as much as I love fitting them and as, as, as successful as we've been with them, they're not always the best answer. So why would we fit corneal lenses instead of scleral lenses? Well, I'll give you a, a list of just a few pros. 
first of all, they're just way easier to fit. All right, they're far less complicated. They're easier to handle. Insertion removal is far simpler. There's certainly reduced cost for the patient. And then there are the patient concerns. And, you know, so what do we mean by patient concerns? I can tell you that I've done a lot of scleral lenses and 98% of those that have ever failed have not failed because I couldn't make them comfortable or because I couldn't get them well fit or give them good vision. 98% of the failures are because of those patient concerns. The insertion removal is really difficult. There is a genuine fear in a, in a fairly large subset of patients about putting something this large in their eyes. So that really can be an issue. So those are the pros for fitting corneal lenses, but what about the cons? Well, let's talk about the elephant in the room here, right? The big con is discomfort. We know that when you put a, a, a corneal GP lens in, it's not going to be comfortable. And I can tell you that early in my career, I shied away from fitting corneal GP lenses because as a know-nothing second-year optometry school student, I was fit with my first pair of corneal GP lenses by another know-nothing second-year student. And they were not comfortable. They were quite uncomfortable. I would say they were painful. And um, I think that tainted me for a long period of time. For a long period of time, it was difficult for me to understand that how could anyone really be comfortable with these? But they can be, trust me. And we're going to get into that and how to make them even more comfortable. But to understand the comfort issue, we have to understand what causes that discomfort. All right. At first glance, the knee-jerk reaction is that it's got to be because it's a rigid material. All right. So it's a hard lens. Of course, it's going to be uncomfortable. But the fact is that that's not the issue. All right because there's also the problem of lens movement. If you think back, if you're just trying to compare corneal GP lens fitting with sclerals, they're all the same material, but sclerals can be really comfortable. Why? Because they don't move, all right? They're not bumping into the edges of your lids, and there is virtually no movement in a scleral lens. So it's not the fact that the material is rigid at all. It is the lens movement. So why does this movement cause discomfort? Well, if we look at the architecture of the corneal nerves, you know, we can see that there's a lot of, we know it's the most highly innervated part of the entire bo human body, all right? There are 40 major corneal nerves. Each one covers about 25% of the cornea. So you have a super sensitive tissue here. So any movement across that, we're gonna sense. Well, that brings up traditional GP lens design, all right? And the traditional GP lens design has been around since 1950, so 70 plus years. All right, it was by, uh, the first GP lens was designed in 1948 by Kevin Tuohy, um, and it was a monocurve lens that was fit very, very flat. But two years later, uh, somebody named George Butterworth designed the first lens that would contour the peripheral cornea more closely and give, me a, give us a better alignment fit. But that was in 1950. And from 1950 until today, corneal GP lenses are designed the same way. So traditional GP lens ordering, you're just going to pick up the phone and you're going to call your favorite lab. You're going to give them the RX, you're going to give them K readings, and you give them an HVID. If you're really sophisticated, maybe you'll give them an eccentricity E value, or perhaps you'll send them topographies. But the vast majority of GP lenses are designed just with these three pieces of data. And God bless these consultants because they are doing an impossible job, and they do a really good job of it. But there's no, they're not sitting in the room with you. They're not seeing what that cornea looks like. They don't understand the corneal architecture. They don't see the topography and the curvature of that individual cornea. So they're going to design a lens typically between eight and a half and 10 millimeters in diameter. 
because they can't go too large because the larger they go, the more they're extrapolating data out from those central corneal keratometry readings. That all changes. And if you know, if you have a perfectly symmetrical cornea, this can work and work reasonably well. But you know, in 37 years, I've never seen a, per a perfectly symmetrical cornea. So what about topographic or even better yet, tomographic corneal designs? Well, now we have tear film independence if we're doing tomographic. And by that, I mean from the pentacam. Uh, we're getting true elevation data rather than a placido disc, which is just giving us um, reflections off the precorneal tear film. This allows us to design a larger diameter lens to go almost full HVID, allows us to contour the cornea far more precisely. In essence, I want you to think about it, you know, if we were to give you an analogy. This would be equivalent to standard corneal GP design. All right, it's an off-the-rack suit. It's not a very good fit, doesn't work very well, it's not very attractive, versus a bespoke design suit. All right, and this is what we can do. This level of sophistication that we can get with something like the Pentacam. So let's take a look at some of the data that we can get from a Pentacam. All right, and show you some of my favorite data displays on the Pentacam. Now, when you first do a, a CSP uh, scan of a, a patient's eye and open it up, CSP is corneal scleral profile. This is the screen you get. And there's some really good data here. If we look on the upper left, you can see the screenshot of the cornea and where this blue line is that is where we're slicing through and giving this image here. So this is a cross-sectional analysis of the cornea, the iris, and the crystalline lens. And we can rotate that using these different scans here. If we look down here, this is adjustable. There's a drop-down list here. This, what I have up here right now is elevation. This is true elevation data of the cornea. The data we're typically going to look for is going to be our K readings. All right. We're going to look at pachymetry in the pupil center and at the thinnest location of that cornea. The other things we're going to see are things like pupil diameter and horizontal white to white, HVID. Now we do have a drop down list of all the scans you can possibly view. These are all the data screens. This actually is my short list. The amount of data screens you can load up is, I'm gonna use the word encyclopedic. Um, I don't know if that's a real word or not, but it's incredible the amount of data that the Pentacam collects. And it'll present it for you in lots of different ways. So this is just my short list. This is user uh, selectable. There's a much longer list of uh, scans that the device can perform. So one of the other scans that I like to look at is the FAST display. And this is really helpful because just with a glance, we can th see things about the chamber, chamber angle, the anterior chamber depth, chamber volume. We can see stuff about pachymetry, all right? Uh, what's the minimum? What is uh, pachymetry at the vertex? Um, we can also see uh, keratometric data, we can see elevation data, and something that something that you're really not all that familiar with is densitometry. This is how clear is that cornea? Is there any op opacification? These bell curves that you see, the red one is abnormal, and the green one is the, the range of normal. So with just a glance, I can see that the chamber, everything is fine. I can also see that Pachymetrically, this eye's got some problems. All right, I don't need to sit and go through a whole bunch of data. I can just look here and just at a glance see what's happening with this eye. All right, I can also see that he's got some densitometry issues. So there is some opacification of this cornea. This is just one of the screens that I like. 
We'll look at the next screen. And here, this is the four maps uh, refractive screen. This lets me look at axial data. It lets me look at true elevation of the front of the cornea, elevation of the back of the cornea, and corneal thickness. Another screen that I like to look at, and I, and by the way, I don't look at every one of these screens for every single patient. I'm just going to choose the ones that I think are most appropriate uh, that would impact my fitting for this patient. And this is called the Bell Ambrosio um, Enhanced Ectasia Display. It tells me about corneal thickness. Is it? it are there any problems with corneal thickness? Are they? Is it pathologic? We can see the elevation on the back of the cornea, the elevation on the front of the cornea. We can then enhance that and by eliminating the central three and a half millimeters uh, and then comparing them. All right, this just tells me whether or not there's keratoconus in this eye. Here we can see um, corneal thickness spatial profile. This is the minimum thickness of the cornea and how does it change from that point on out to the periphery. And the center line, that's the normal. Um, the two lines above and below it are one standard deviation away from normal. And again, it just gives us a, an index of suspicion for keratoconus. These boxes down here, when we see them in red, this tells us there is definitely some abnormality going on here. I mentioned densitometry before. This is the densitometry display, and uh, it's showing me cornea average densitometry. And I'm going to put this into motion. I'm actually going to go to the next slide. And this is maximum densitometry. It's the same scan. We can scan through the thickness of the cornea. And you'll see this little red line here. I can move that up and down to look through different layers of the cornea. So let's put this into motion. And let's see if I can do that with, get rid of the laser pointer, and we'll give a video. And as I, as you, as I move these over, you're gonna see me scan down through the corneal thickness, and you're gonna see the displays change. And of course, it does not want to play. Oh, there we go. Um, and here we go. We're going to scan through that corneal thickness, and you're going to see how this display changes. As we get down here, there's less opacification. We can see that whiter area in the cornea. That's the more, uh, more opacification. But there's a way to look at it to enhance the view. We can do it in color. And you can see that red portion up here. This would be the portion of the cornea and the epithelium that is more dense. So it tells me there's corneal scarring going on here. And um, there's likely going to be some visual in, uh, impact from that. And as we scan down through the thickness of the cornea, we can see that it gets clearer as we get towards the endothelium. This is the Shine Flug image. It allows me to, again, to look through a cross-sectional analysis of the cornea, the iris, and the crystalline lens. And I can scan through any orientation. So let's say it's a, a cone, or if I wanted to see an intact, I could just rotate this around and scan through different areas of the cornea. Again, another useful data display. The final one I'm going to show you is this is an iris image. And I sometimes like looking at this. Uh, it's not the one I use all that often, but uh, we can remove this um, topographic display and just see the cornea and the, and the entire anterior surface of the eye and the iris. Or we can put this on here and I can change the opacity. I like doing this, especially for this one. You can see that this is a patient who's had LASIK and the ablation zone is decentered superiorly. It's just easier to visualize this way. Also is helpful if there are things like pinguecula or, or pterygia that you think might 
become an issue for fitting scleral lenses. All right, that's just the background data. Let's get into the stuff you really want to see. All right, some case reports. Case number one is, but I had LASIK. This gentleman's pre-LASIK pre uh, Rx was greater than minus 20. It was more than 20 years ago. He does not recall his exact number, but he said it was greater than minus 20. There's what his Scheinflug image looks like. His K readings are pretty flat, 32.7 by 34.4. His packs are, considering he's over a minus 20, he's got a pretty decent pack still, over 400 microns. Um, he had to be well over 600 microns before they did his, um, his LASIK. He's failed previously with contact lenses. With a cornea that flat, there is no soft lens that he's going to be able to wear that's going to sit on that eye. And uh, any GP lenses, if they're fit traditionally, are just not going to work for him. Uh, again, that flat cornea, the lens would move all over the place. And when he tried, it would eject out of his eye just with a blink very readily. He is extremely photophobic. He's got an axial length of 33.613, and he has myopic maculopathy. His best corrected acuity, well, he's unable to be corrected, all right, um, is 2400, and he does have manual dexterity issues. He has a tremor, and it'd be very difficult for him to handle lenses. So what are my options with this patient, all right? Well, you could say we could try spectacle lenses, but I was unable to get a refraction on him at all. No improvement, plus or minus. He's 2,400. Um, so glasses are definitely not going to work for him. How about scleral lenses? Now, this was my first impulse when this gentleman came in. Um, he came in for a scleral consult. And scleral lenses are my fallback. All right, I haven't fit him with sclerals. And because this is, we're talking about corneal GP lenses, you know that's what I ended up choosing, right? Um, why would corneal lenses be better for this patient than sclerals? Well, he's very photophobic. He barely wants to open his eye. That's number one. Number two, he has manual dexterity issues. And for him, insertion removal would be an impossibility. Perhaps his wife could do it. But he's 73, 74. I'm not exactly certain of his age. Um, his wife doesn't want to do it. I can tell you that. So let's see what his corneas look like. So here's his pentacams. And you can see we have a very asymmetric cornea, where that ablation zone is decentered superiorly. And um, this is going to be a challenge, all right? Uh, we can see his elevation map down here. You know, we can see that um, his corneal thickness here. But let's see a little bit. Let's look a little bit closer at that elevation map. And um, we want to see what's the diameter of his cornea. His horizontal white to white is 11.9 millimeters. And so that's horizontal. Vertically, the vertical um, visible iris diameter is typically 0.4 to 0.5 millimeters less than that. So I know I don't want to go an 11.9 millimeter diameter. I don't even want to go up to an 11.5. I'm going to design a, a corneal GP lens for him, and I'm ultimately going to do it larger um, than might be done with a standard lens, but let's put a standard lens on his eye. Let's try and design a standard GP lens using WAVE. So this would be a standard GP lens. This is a rotationally symmetrical, or in other words, spherical contact lens. This is a nine millimeter diameter lens. And down here, we can see that, um, 
it's sitting way up off the cornea. This thing is going to vault the cornea tremendously. And we see that here. You see all this fluorescein. This is the fluorescein simulation. Um, we can see lots of pooling here and hard bearing down here. And actually, if we look at the next slide, it's going to show us in the vertical meridian the exact profile underneath that lens. You can see we're bearing down here, and that would be here. And up here, we've got lots of pooling of fluorescein. So this is a really poorly fit lens. This lens is going to move all over the place. It's probably going to pop out of his eye every time he blinks. So what did I design instead? Well, using wave, I can design a lens that's going to contour that cornea far more closely. And that's what we've done here. You can see we've got a really nice application to the cornea. Um, to be able to do this, you'd never be able to do this with just uh, keratometry and RX. You're, you're going to have to contour this cornea. This has to be as individualized to his eye as uh, the thumbprint on that hand. And I did do an 11 millimeter diameter lens. So there's what the fluorescein simulation looks like on the upper left over here. What does that lens look like on his eye? So there's the fluorescein simulation. This is the actual lens on that on this gentleman's eye. All right, it's a well-fit lens. It's covering 90, 95% of the cornea. It's decentered slightly um, temporally, but it's a well-fit lens. The results are it's a good stable fit. You see there's no rotation on that lens. It's not prism ballasted. This is a um, this is just contouring his cornea. And he has so much asymmetry to the cornea that the asymmetry on the rear surface of the lens is going to basically lock it in place. His best corrected acuity now is 2060. Now, most of the time we would look at 2060 acuity and say, that's pretty crummy. But for somebody who's only seen 2400 for the past 20 years, this gentleman was, was sitting in, the, in my exam chair just crying. Uh, he was so happy. Um, but that's with a corneal GP lens. Uh, I kept the sclerals in, in reserve if I needed them. Uh, I could have tried to go that way, but this was going to be a way easier for him to do. And this patient's ecstatic. So that's been great. Let's take a look at the next case. And this is an AFAKE. So this is a 60 year old, 62 year old white male um, who had RK, AK. 20 years ago. So radial keratotomy, astigmatic keratotomy, 20 plus years ago. There is his Scheinflug image. He also was born with retinopathy or prematurity. He developed cataracts, had cataract surgery later developed a retinal detachment. During the surgery to repair that retinal detachment, he had an IOL dislocation and subsequently had to have that IOL explanted. He's an AFAKE in that eye. There's his RX, plus 10, minus 6, axis 82. But amazingly, this gentleman sees really well. He's better than 2020 in this eye. And he was referred in by his retinal specialist asking me to help because uh, during his retinal repair, that's when the IOL became dislocated and needed to be removed. So again, I have the same options. You know, what am I going to fit him with? Well, we went with corneal GP lenses. Sclerals, I am holding in reserve for this, this patient. Um, 
I did not fit in with sclerals, although again, that was my initial uh, reaction was I was gonna fit him within a scleral lens. But he's not worn contact lenses in more than 20 years. Um, this would just be easier, and I, I really wanted to try a corneal GP lens on him. So here's what his Pentacam looks like. This is the four map selectable. Um, I can choose any one of these maps. I can put any map I want in each one of those boxes. But we're looking at his axial map, his tangential map. And if you look at that tangential map, you can almost see where those uh, RK incisions were. Um, looking at his elevation map, and here this is really interesting because we can see there's a huge elevation difference vertically versus horizontally. Um, and then we can look at his thickness map. So what did I design for him? So this is the lens I designed. Uh, you can see we've got lots of clearance here centrally. Uh, if we look over here on the wave design screen, this is what my simulated fluorescein would look like. I do not have actual fluorescein images of this lens on eye, unfortunately. Um, this is what the topography looks like. And this is what the rear surface of this lens is going to look like. Um, so you can see this really matches up really well with the surface of his cornea. By being able to contour the the rear surface of this lens so closely to the cornea, that, that lens is gonna sit exactly where I want it to, and it's gonna do exactly what I want it to do. Now, I could have brought this in closer alignment to the cornea. I actually steepened the base curve because I wanted to decrease lens thickness a bit. Um, this lens is 0.52 millimeters deep, I think. Um, or thick rather. Um, I did it in Boston XO2 for a super high decay of 141 because I want to make sure that he gets enough oxygen through that very thick lens to that cornea. If we look at this lens in the vertical meridian, and now I'm slicing through vertically, um, you can see that again we've got pretty good alignment. It little, sits a little closer here. But let's see, what does that lens look like on eye? And there's the lens on eye. Um, that's a really well-fit lens. Again, a, a, a very happy patient. And with that contour the rear, on the rear surface of the lens, you know it's mating that cornea perfectly. That thing's not going to rotate. I did not have to put prism ballast in this lens. Uh, it just was a really well-fit well lens. It's stable. His BVA is better than 2020. I got him to 2020 plus two with this lens. And again, it's a happy patient. So these are the kinds of things that tomographic design can do. I mean, topographic design can do similar things, but when you go from using Placido disc topography to the shine plug images in the Pentacam, it just ups your game tremendously um, because now instead of just extrapolated data as you get further away from the corneal apex, you're getting true measured data on out to almost as far as 21 millimeters across that cornea. So that just really allows you to be really precise with your fits. So that's what I've been doing for years to make corneal GP lenses more comfortable. But at the opening of, of, the, of this evening, I mentioned some new concepts in designing corneal GP lenses. Uh, we're gonna get into that now. So what else is there that we can do to improve comfort for corneal GP lenses? Well, let's go back to that corneal nerve distribution map. And if we look carefully at this, you can see that there is a huge density of corneal nerves centrally. But if we move out here into the periphery, there's far fewer nerve fibers out here. It stands to reason that the cornea is gonna be far less sensitive out here. So if we were to be able to ride out in the periphery, 
that should produce less sensation on the cornea. We would vault centrally and therefore avoid touching any of these nerves. Well, this is exactly the concept that was proposed last month at GSLS by Pat Caroline and Randy Kojima. So I definitely give them kudos. Uh, I thought it was an ingenious design. In essence, you're, you're taking the concept of a scleral lens and putting it on the cornea. You're just riding it instead of out on the, the sclera, you're riding it on the corneal periphery. So it should theoretically be a much more comfortable lens. And I gotta tell you, this intrigued the heck out of me when I saw this. Um, I knew darn well I was gonna come back and play with this, this concept. Uh, so this was just about a month ago. As I mentioned earlier, you know, GP lens design has not changed since 1950. Uh, this represents, a, you know, a kind of a revolutionary idea in doing this. So who is the first patient? Well, I needed a guinea pig, so I'm the first patient. So these are, this is my map, this is my pentacam. And I decided, especially since I'm the contact lens patient we all would hate to have, all right, um, nothing is quite right for me. <laughs> um, I decided not just to do this plateau design, but let's do a comparison. Let's do what I would have done all along prior to seeing uh, Pat and Randy's uh, presentation. So I designed an alignment fit lens. Um, my cornea is 11.9 and I designed an 11.1 millimeter diameter lens. And you can see it really contours the cornea very nicely. The problem is I don't have much corneal tericity, yet I've got a diopter and a half up against the rule cylinder, it's lenticular. And so that means I need to put a front surface torque on my eye. And um, since my cornea is fairly symmetrical, there's not a lot to hold it in place. So I'm gonna have to put prism ballast in this lens. So, I also designed the plateau lens, all right? And all I did was take the exact same lens, same diameter, same base curve, same power, and just elevate the center of that lens, all right? Lift it up off the center of the cornea. And if I put these two designs side by side, you can see that here we're just nicely contouring the cornea. This should give me a comfortable lens. Over here, this is this plateau design, all right? I'm not gonna be touching central cornea at all. Theoretically, this should give me a more comfortable lens. Well, what happened when I actually did it? So let's pull up the lenses, all right? These are the actual lenses on my eye. On the left, you can see that alignment curvature lens, and there's there's some fluorescing underneath that lens, but it's sitting very close to the cornea. Uh, on the right, you can see that plateau design and lots of fluorescing pooling underneath the cornea. I have to tell you, the verdict is that they were both pretty comfortable. I was really surprised by how comfortable the alignment lens actually was, but it was far more comfortable on that plateau design. So I can tell you that I'm going to be working with this. Um, the downside for me, and if you look carefully at these lenses, you can see it, is that with that front surface, front surface, front toric surface lens, I need that prism ballast, and those lenses are rotating. You can also see that on the, um, the alignment lens, there's less rotation, therefore my visual acuity was better, uh, we're only about 10 degrees rotated there. On the uh, the plateau lens, there's less to hold that lens in place. There's less interaction with the cornea, uh, and there's less to keep it aligned. So it's rotating 20 to 30 degrees. Um, so that did blur my vision. So I would have to go back to the drawing board and redesign these. I'm not so sure that I'm going to want to do 
front surface torx on using this plateau design uh, unless there's a lot of corneal tericity uh, something some asymmetry to hold that lens in place so this was just me and this is an n of one all right i i can't tell you i know a lot more than that just yet but i decided well let's do a regular patient so it just so happened that two days later i had the perfect candidate come in the office so this is my last case this patient had rk plus ak 20 years ago it didn't work all that well so they subsequently did lasik um incredibly flat corneas 28 3 by 32 5. her packs are pretty thick um but a really really flat cornea she had cataract surgery uh, about a decade ago she also has myopic maculopathy and a fairly long eyeball 29 just over 29 millimeters long her best corrected acuity she's lost most of the vision in her right eye um, due to myopic maculopathy her left eye the best corrected that she's been able to get is 2080 so here's what her corneas look like you can see again you can see these irregularities in the map that's where her incisions were from her rk uh, if we look more carefully at her elevation map you can see she's got a fairly large elevation right here it's uh you know better than 60 microns and compared to the central cornea you know she's about 90 microns uh, difference from here to here so let's design a lens for her all right well, let's look in there's that 60 micron elevation if we look more carefully at her shine flug image we can see over here eh, that's probably that elevation that's right where she's got that 62 micron elevation in the cornea so we're gonna have to contour that as well all right we're gonna have to vault or, or contour this entire cornea and again you can see how flat it is so let's do her design and let's do a plateau design. So this is the lens I came up with. Now this is looking at a cross section through the lens in the horizontal meridian. If we were to look at the vertical meridian, you can see that it drops down a little bit closer to the cornea. This is the 20 micron line. Uh, below this fluorescein gets harder to visualize. It doesn't mean we're actually touching the cornea, but it gets harder to see. That there's any there's much fluorescein there so what would happen when i design this lens and i create this lens and let's put it on the eye well this is the lens on eye and let's put it in motion and you can see that darker area inferiorly down here that aligns beautifully with that 62 micron elevation on the cornea but you can see that we're not touching the rest of the cornea we're not touching here either, it's just it's closer to this portion of the cornea. So we are riding out here in the mid periphery. She loved the lens. She was very comfortable, um, was got excellent acuity, and she was a very happy camper. And that's my presentation. So any questions? Hey, Tom, great, great cases, one after another of really remarkable cases. Um, I, I've got a couple of just basic questions for you about using, utilizing WAVE in the Pentacam. Yep. Um, number one, do you want to comment a little bit about scan acquisition, about extrapolated data? What do you look for as far as when you choose a scan to import into WAVE and what matters to you? so i'm looking for scan quality obviously um and depending on on the patient and almost every one of these patients came in for a scleral consult with me so we can do several different types of scans using the pentacam i can do um, a scan that's 
maybe a little easier to capture, but it captures a smaller area. That's just the, the high resolution scan. But I'm doing corneoscleral CSP scans, which are getting get the entire cornea. And usually it's gonna take us two, sometimes three captures and to do a composite to get the entire cornea. Um, you know, I, it's just, my techs don't always know that I'm gonna do a corneal lens, so they're preparing for a scleral lens, and it's better to have more data than less. So that's what we do. Um, and we just look for complete captures. The, the, the device will tell us if the quality of the scan is good or not. And so there is that metric that we use. As far as deciding what type of lens to design regarding freeform versus geometrically symmetrical, what, what, what you talked about criteria, what, what do you look for as far as when to decide to go to freeform versus a more symmetrical design? So historically, I would have used uh, geometrically symmetrical designs more often than I do now. I'm, I'm doing most of them are, are freeform designs um, because I can just contour the cornea better. If we go back to that one image that I showed you, you know, the, that incredible shape in that cornea and yet that patient, I was able to create the rear surface of that lens to mate that cornea so perfectly. You know, it's just one of those things that teaches me that freeform is probably a really good thing to use. Um, if I have very symmetrical corneas, then I'll, I can use a G-SIM or geometrically symmetrical design. But most of the corneas I'm dealing with are pretty asymmetric. Um, so free, I, in my opinion, freeform is the better option most of the time. Are you routinely adding prism to those freeform lenses, or do you wait to to you add a second remake, or does your initial lens you put prism in just to try to stabilize that freeform design, or it, it depends it, on how asymmetric the eye is. It really depends on the asymmetry in the eye. If I have at least 30 to 40 microns asymmetry, I'm going to try doing it without putting a prism ballast in the lens. If I have less than that, I know I'm going to need prism ballast. Uh, so that's, I'd say 40, 40 microns is probably my cutoff. If I don't have at least that much elevation difference from the flat meridian to the steep meridian, then I'm going to go with a, 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 a prism ballasted lens. Gotcha. What about any rules of thumb you have if you're going to a corneal RGP as far as diameter selection? Is there any any hard and fast rules you use with white to white and subtracting a number or, or how do you how do you go about choosing your diameter? So the nice thing about the Pentacam is it tells us horizontal white to white and it's it's pretty accurate uh, horizontally but again they're the, in the vertical dimension corneas are usually not perfectly round and so I, I, I'll just automatically subtract 0. 0.4 to 0. 0.5 millimeters off whatever that is horizontal white to white is. Um, and then I'm gonna try and do 90 to 95% of that number. Um, that seems to work well for me. So you're still going with a fairly large diameter lens even on these, in these complex eyes? Especially on these complex eyes because it, it helps lock it into place. Um, it makes the lens more comfortable. And again, I'm trying to avoid the movement of that lens. So the larger I go, the less it's going to move. And um, it, it, again, in, for me, that seems to be what works the best. I'm not a fan of doing small GP lenses. I'm also not a tremendous fan of putting corneal GP lenses on cones. And I know that's a, an area of major dispute and debate between um, specialty lens fitters. Uh, my feeling is that if you have a cone, unless it's fairly mild, um, I don't want to take any chances on, uh, you know, rubbing the, that central cornea that I don't feel that that's normal healthy tissue. And I'm really concerned about, you know, creating scarring in that corneal apex. I've seen far too many corneas where they've been fit with small, like eight or eight and a half millimeter lenses, trying to balance on that on that cone apex and end up with just dense scarring. And um, 
I've always done everything I could to avoid that. A uh, quick question from the audience. Um, there was a question regarding when you're designing these uh, lenses and patients often are coming in thinking maybe they're going to get a scleral lens fit in. There are reasons why you want to switch them to to corneal lenses. And um, and the question was, do you use the tomography from the CSP scan or do you go out and get a separate tomography um, for that patient when you're doing a corneal lens? And I, I will say that I, I've never seen the difference between the central CSP scan and a single isolated tomography from the Pentacam. So I haven't, I might personally have not seen any difference in the two, but what, has your experience any different, Tom? No, you know, I've, I've never actually done that. You know, I, as I said before, capturing more data than I might actually use is not a bad thing. Um, I don't think there's any difference in the scans. Uh, uh, if I know I'm going to do it's it's exactly the same slip scan, so there's no there's no difference between a single yeah. tomography scan and then the central part of CSP. So I, I don't think there's any difference between that. But I, I, since the question was asked, us, so I figured I'd bring it up to you and see if you've ever had that experience. No, I've never I've I've never tried to do that. I mean, there are times my when we first started doing pentacams, my staff was capturing every scan that they possibly could, and they were often doing both CSPs and the central scan as well. I'd still use the CSP data. I mean, it's just, I don't think there's any difference between the two of them, so. Yeah, and they, mechanically, there shouldn't be any difference at all, other than the normal variation you would get from scan to scan, which is very minor. Right. All right, looks like we've got all our questions answered. Tom, thanks again for this fantastic presentation. Really four very interesting cases, and I appreciate you sharing your expertise with us tonight. It was great, I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much, and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, have a good evening, everyone.